Welcome to part two of my deep dive into the glamorous lives of the women Truman Capote called the Swans. They epitomised elegance, refinery and wealth in the mid-20th century, and often found themselves in the gossip columns too. In part one, I focused on the five women who are central characters in the second season of Feud, which tells the story of how Truman's swans shunned him after he brutally satirised their lives in a short story published in Esquire magazine, and today I will be exploring the lives of the other swans who are not featured in Feud. To understand Truman's fascination with the beauty and glamour of New York's high society, one has to look at his childhood. He was born Truman Streckfuss Persons on the 30th of September 1924. His father Arch Persons was a salesman, always looking for the next get-rich-quick scheme, and his mother Lily Mae Falk was a pretty and ambitious woman who dreamed of a glamorous life she had hoped her husband could give her. Instead, they moved from hotel room to hotel room, and Truman was often left by himself while his parents went out. Despite his young age, he was aware of the men who came to see his mother when his father was away. At age six, Truman was dumped with his mother's relatives in Monroeville, Alabama, the town Lily May had dreamed of escaping. There, Truman found a friend for life in his neighbour Harper Lee, who went on to write To Kill a Mockingbird. Monroeville was monotonous, but it was there that Truman's love for writing began, and he developed close relationships with some of his family members. After his parents' divorce, his mother moved to New York City with the hopes of social climbing, and married a Cuban businessman called Jose Garcia Capote, who adopted Truman. Lily May was happier in her second marriage, and the family lived in a nice house on Park Avenue, but then Jose Capote was caught embezzling money, and the family moved to Connecticut. Truman eventually returned to New York in the early 1940s and got to know the famous trio of Gloria Vanderbilt, Una O'Neill, and Carol Grace Marcus. Gloria was one of the wealthiest heiresses in America, and we shall see more of her later. Una was the daughter of a famous playwright, and she scandalised the nation in 1943 when she married Charlie Chaplin, who was 36 years older than her only a month after her 18th birthday. Carol Grace was an actress and author. Like most of Truman's friends, it is thought the trio inspired the character of Holly Golightly in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Truman frequented the same clubs as the trio, and began his rise to social acclaim in New York. It was his 1948 novel, Other Voices, Other Rooms, however, that gave him his first real taste of fame. It was a bestseller, and a source of controversy, which only made Capote more popular in New York society. The main character and the general storyline are based on Truman himself, and the book remained on the New York Times bestsellers list for nine weeks. Capote always had a fascination with the rich and beautiful. All his swans were glamorous and interesting, and if they didn't possess natural beauty, they created such an image for themselves that overawed most people. But Truman was their confidant. He made them laugh and gave them advice. He could talk about vacuous gossip for hours, but he also educated his swans on literature and culture. Babe Paley developed a love of reading because of him, and he gave Gloria Vanderbilt insightful writing advice. Breakfast at Tiffany's is iconic, but what really cemented Truman among the canon of American literary greats was his 1966 true crime book, In Cold Blood, a meticulous piece of journalism that told the story of a family who were murdered in a small farming town, and became an instant bestseller that gave Truman real financial stability. It is often regarded as his best work, but he actually thought he had an even better book in him. From the late 1950s until the mid-1970s, Truman worked on Answered Prayers, a book about New York high society he said would be the American equivalent to Marcel Proust's remembrance of things past. He missed deadline after deadline writing it, and even had to pay back the advances he received. Finally, the first chapter, titled La Cote Basque 1965, was published in Esquire magazine in the November of 1975, and it proved to be his undoing. His friends' and enemies' secrets were laid bare for the world to see. People who had let him into their lives completely, some for well over a decade, were mocked in a vulgar fashion. Overnight, Truman was shut out of the high society circles he'd been adored by, and some swans never spoke a word to him again. Even before the publication of La Cote Basque 1965, it caused fallings out. And that brings us to our first swan. Morella Agnelli fits the title of Swan, the best of all Truman's friends, but it wasn't originally given to her by him. 
famous photographer Richard Avedon took a portrait of her in 1953 that highlighted her extremely long neck, and thereafter she was known as the Swan. Years later, Truman called her the Last Swan, and that became the title of her autobiography. Morella was born Morella Caracciolo de Castagneto in Florence on the 4th of May 1927. Her father, Filippo, belonged to the house of Caracciolo, one of the most prominent families in the Kingdom of Naples, and was both a prince and a duke, while Morella's mother, Margaret Clark, was an American heiress whose family had made their fortune in the whiskey business. Morella grew up in Villa I Cancelli, a slightly dilapidated house situated in the hills surrounding Florence. As a child, Morella grew to appreciate the art of gardening, and that would be a passion of hers throughout her life and at night she would often sneak out of bed and go down to the garden for the thrill of experiencing it in darkness. Her youth was spent around other old aristocratic families and a number of expatriates like her American mother. She went to Paris to study art at the Julian School, before moving to New York and following in the footsteps of many other wealthy girls by becoming a model editor and sometime photographer for glamorous magazines such as Harper's Bazaar and Vogue. One of her greatest passions, however, was interior design. In childhood, she had learned the power of a tastefully decorated house, and over the course of her life, she would take a hands-on role in curating her many homes. Architects and designers were desperate to work with her. Designing an Agnelli residence was a career highlight, after all. In 1953, Morella became a leading lady in European society through her marriage to Gianni Agnelli, the grandson of one of the founders of Fiat. After his father's death and horrific seaplane accident, 24-year-old Gianni inherited his family's fortune and business, making him the richest man in Italy. He was known for his wild playboy lifestyle as a member of the fast set. He owned multiple lavish homes, raced around the Riviera in fast cars, sailed yachts and partied, all of which often landed him and his family in the gossip columns. He was six years older than Morella, but before she even met him, she'd been attracted to him. Her friends often spoke of his various exploits, and at the time, Fiat was Italy's biggest automobile manufacturer. Morella married him on the 19th of November 1953, wearing a Balenciaga wedding dress. Seven months later, a son, Eduardo, was born, and the couple also had a daughter called Margarita. In order to create the kind of perfect life Gianni expected, Morella had to sacrifice time spent with her children, and they were taken care of by staff all throughout their childhoods. Morella had always loved learning, and in the first months of her marriage, she spent most days reading. Gianni was concerned with her lack of domestic skills, and one day Morella received a call from an older woman called Contessa Lily Volpi, who told her, Remember, my dear girl, all one needs to catch a husband may be a bed, but it takes a whole house to keep one. Contessa Volpi took Morella under her wing and taught her how to deal with the running of large households. Volpi herself presided over Palazzo Volpi in Venice, where she held grand balls every September for years, inviting over 500 members of Italian high society. She taught Morella how to plan a successful dinner, how to manage a large staff, where to get uniforms made and sheets monogrammed. Contessa Volpi was a wealth of knowledge that helped Morella adjust to her new luxurious lifestyle and become one of the greatest tastemakers and hostesses of her time. The Agnellis loved to collect art and decorated their homes with the best of everything. Their collection included pieces by Picasso, Renoir and Matisse, among others, and soon it became so vast they needed to build entire houses to contain the artworks. They bought a villa overlooking Turin, an apartment in Milan, and a duplex in Manhattan just for this purpose. Morella was also an avid gardener, transforming the gardens of each of her homes into living artworks to rival the pieces that hung on her walls. In the early 1960s, the Agnellis became friends with the Kennedys, who shared their passion for yachting. Around this time, Morella also became acquainted with Truman Capote, who also claimed to love yachts, but the Agnellis soon discovered he only enjoyed lounging about on them. He was good fun to have on a sailing trip, and soon Morella considered him to be one of her closest friends, if not the closest. Morella believed the emotional intimacy of their friendship was reserved for her alone. She also believed she was the only swan, until she went to a luncheon where the rest of the flock were present, and observed how Truman behaved exactly with them as he did with her. When Morella told him that she had thought she was the only swan, Truman replied, Oh well, darling. 
As well as being the youngest swan and the only European one, Morella had special privilege among them, and that was getting a look at the first few chapters of Answered Prayers. Morella was aggravated not only by the fact that it exposed all the painful secrets of Truman's friends, but that he was wasting his genius on something that Morella thought read like a gossip column. Morella, like other friends of Truman's, advised him not to publish it, but he didn't listen. Morella may have been the first swan to fall out with Truman over the story, but she was certainly not the last. Morella remained married to Gianni until his death in 2003. Throughout their marriage, she had to endure the pain of his many affairs and the pressure of his sky-high expectations of absolute perfection, but she learned to do so with grace. After her husband's death, Morella bought Villa Ayanul Kasmu in Marrakesh, Morocco, which had originally been created for a relative of the Russian writer Leo Tolstoy. She enjoyed creating a beautiful garden there, and said one is never really done with a garden, just as one is never done with life. Day by day and step by step, one just keeps on finding new and clever ways to make them flourish, both in sunshine and in storm. She published her memoir, The Last Swan, in 2014, and died in 2019. Our next swan is Gloria Guinness, and Capote said of her, When I first saw her, I thought that I'd never seen anyone more perfect. Her posture, the way she held her head, the way she moved. She was born Gloria Rubio y Alatorre in Guadalajara, Mexico, on the 27th of August 1912, when the country was at the beginning of the revolution that would claim over a million lives. Gloria's father was a journalist who supported the president Francisco Madero. Madero was deposed and killed the year after Gloria was born and her father fled to the United States without his family and remained there in exile until his death in 1916. Gloria's mother was a descendant of conquistadors, but more recently the family had made their money in sugar. Gloria's early memories were of the strict Catholic nuns who helped raise her, and her hard-working mother, who had a talent for making clothes by hand. From a young age, her beauty was apparent, and her mother encouraged and expected her to use it to her advantage. In adulthood, she stood at five foot nine, had silky black hair and a neck so long she more than deserved the title of swan on its merit alone. She, her mother, and siblings tried to wait out the conflict in the countryside, but when the fighting reached them, they went to Mexico City, and it was there at the age of 20 Gloria married for the first time in 1933 to a wealthy Dutch director of a sugar factory called Jacobus H. Scholten's. He was 47, and the marriage ended only two years later. With hardly any money, Gloria set off for Paris, where she got by working as a model and used her beauty and inherent style, even on a tight budget, to charm her way up the social ladder. She played up her Mexican accent and deliberately used the wrong grammar. Men were enchanted by her exotic appearance, which she told them was what every girl looked like in Mexico. She achieved her dream of entering the international set of aristocrats, nouveau riche and glamorous personalities with her second marriage in 1935 to Franz Egon, Graf von Fürstenberg Hendrigen. He had a daughter from his first marriage and was 39, but he was a count and now Gloria was Countess Fürstenberg and belonged to one of the oldest families in Germany. The couple got married in England but lived in Berlin, which was an interesting experience for Gloria. The upper echelons of Berlin didn't approve of a high-ranking German like her husband marrying a Mexican and in their view muddying his perfect Germanic lineage with the birth of their two children. But they had to be accepting of Gloria to her face, and during the war she distracted herself from the horrors all around her as many did by partying every night and losing herself in the social whirl. Her husband wrote infrequently from the Russian front, and as bombs regularly rained down on Berlin, its inhabitants turned to alcohol and other substances to escape. Even in the midst of war, the city's nightlife thrived. One night, Gloria met Walter Schellenberg, a high-ranking German spy who supposedly had an affair with Coco Chanel. By this time, Gloria wanted to divorce her husband and get herself and her children out of the country. She began an affair with Schellenberg, and some even suspected her of being a spy for the Germans as well. While in Spain with her lover, she met Ahmed Fakhri, the grandson of King Fawad I of Egypt, whom she married in 1946. During their engagement, she went to Paris and began an affair with the British ambassador to France, Duff Cooper. Men simply couldn't resist Gloria's beauty, impeccable style, and the mystery that enveloped her and her past. 
Throughout her life, she invented various stories about her origins without having any apparent reason to do so. She broke things off with Duff Cooper when she went to America to marry Ahmed Fakhri, but wanted to resume the affair again when she returned to Paris. Duff Cooper even pulled strings to allow her to stay in France when the government wanted to kick her out on suspicion of her activities during the war. Her third marriage only lasted until 1949, and in 1951 she married one of the richest men in the world at the time, Thomas Lowell Guinness, a member of Parliament and a scion of the banking branch of the Guinness family. His father had died shortly before his marriage to Gloria, leaving him a fortune of two hundred million dollars, which is the equivalent today of over two billion. The French made him an officer of the Legion of Honor for his service flying fighting planes in the Battle of Britain, and he had been married twice before. He had returned from travelling to find his first wife having an affair with Playboy Ali Khan, who we'll see more of later, and Lowell had cheated on his second wife, leading to their divorce. Her fourth and final marriage allowed Gloria to fully realise her lifelong dream of not only belonging to but leading the utmost echelons of society. She became close friends with the king and queen of the international set, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and Gloria was a perfect hostess at the soirees she held at the Guinnesses' many homes. Lowell's son from his first marriage, Patrick, fell in love with Dolores, Gloria's daughter from her second marriage, and the step siblings married in 1955. Gloria ranked high on the best dress list and was irritated when Jackie Kennedy achieved a higher place than her. Gloria reached its hall of fame in the mid 1960s. For Gloria, dressing was an art. Wearing clothes well was her passion, and she had close friendships with many designers and sat front row at fashion shows. Her annual clothing budget is estimated at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which comes to about one point five million currently. Despite being surrounded by wealth and luxury, in some ways Gloria felt desperately unfulfilled. She said she felt like a well-dressed housewife. She wrote a play that she almost got produced in London before her husband stopped her, as he did with her novel too. She outshone Lowell in every regard, and he was jealous of her popularity and ability to charm. Gloria knew that everything she had came from him, and while no prenuptial agreement between them is publicly known of, Lowell was far too cautious when it came to his fortune not to make Gloria give him some kind of legal protection before their marriage. And she knew if she left him, her lavish lifestyle, where taking a private jet or a helicopter were regular ways to travel, would abruptly come to an end. She did become a columnist for Harper's Bazaar, however, and even received an award for her writing. Gloria loved having Truman Capote around. He considered her to be one of the three great beauties of her time, the two others being Babe Paley and Greta Garbo. Gloria and another swan, Cezy Guest, competed for whose Palm Beach mansion he would stay at when he came down to Florida. His quick wit brightened any party, and Gloria took him on many yacht holidays. He lounged in. He lounged on the Guinness's yacht, sipping drinks on one such holiday, sailing along the Turkish coast in 1968, ignoring the deadline for answered prayers his publishers had set him. When Truman refused to accompany the Guinness's on their tours of famous archaeological sites, which he referred to as dumb old rocks, Gloria said, "Truman, I really don't understand why you're not coming with us." To which he replied, "Gloria, what you're doing is the single most boring thing I could conceive of." Gloria and Truman also went to the 1964 Cassius Clay Sunny Liston fight in Miami, and Gloria was a guest at Truman's famous black and white ball in 1966, where she wore two necklaces so heavy she had to recover in bed from the weight of them for two days afterwards. Truman and Gloria matched each other well in wit, and often in their brazen attitudes too. On her climb to the zenith point of society after World War II, when others in her place would have taken on a meek personality after her activities during the war, Gloria moved through society with confidence and humour. When asked what her favourite charity was, her answer was myself. She died of a heart attack while in Switzerland in 1980. She was 68 years old. Truman was thrilled to know Pamela Harriman. She was exactly his sort of person, and provided endless inspiration for answered prayers because she was always getting herself into a scandal. Truman said of her, "She's interesting because she has fantastic taste and knows everything about everything, but she has absolutely no intellectual capacities at all. She's some sort of marvelous primitive. I don't think she's ever read a book or even a newspaper except for the gossip column." 
Slim Keith, another swan, had her second husband stolen from her by Pamela, which resulted in their social circle taking sides. Truman's favourite swan, Babe Paley, took Slim's side, and Truman decided to invite both women out to lunch one day with a surprise guest. That guest turned out to be Pamela. Slim and Babe weren't amused. If you added all the names Pamela had over her life together, she would be called Pamela Digby Churchill Hayward Harriman, but she began her life on the 20th of March 1920 as just Pamela Digby, and that name was notable enough, as the Digbys were a very old English aristocratic family. Her father, Edward Digby, was the 11th Baron Digby. And Pamela's great-great-aunt was the 19th century adventurer Jane Digby, who in her mid-forties married an Arab sheikh 20 years her junior and lived in the desert with him. Pamela grew up in Minturn House in Dorset, which had been in the Digby family since 1768 and had a staff of 20. It was surrounded by some of the most picturesque countryside England had to offer, but from a young age Pamela dreamed of life in the big city. As a child, Pamela sometimes accompanied her parents on various travels, including an extended stay in Australia. She and her younger sister were sent to down on boarding school for girls in Essex, which was essentially a finishing school intended to prepare its pupils for advantageous marriages. For the English upper classes at the time, it was considered unattractive for a woman to be overly academic. Social graces were the important thing to master. This suited Pamela perfectly, who preferred riding horses to studying and was extremely outgoing. Her debut into society, however, was somewhat disastrous. Her parents refused to buy her expensive dresses like all the other debutantes wore, and her cheap clothes were laughed at. Her overconfidence put the other girls off, and they shunned her. But she did make one friend in Kathleen Kennedy, the favourite sister of President JFK. Pamela was still determined to move in high society, and so she found a woman to guide her. Lady Olive Bailey, who resided at Leeds Castle in Kent. Lady Bailey took Pamela under her wing and invited her along to the weekends where an interesting group of Bailey's friends came down to Leeds Castle. Pamela was inspired by the little world Lady Bailey had created to revolve around herself, and these weekends taught Pamela many things. She refined her social skills and became known as an animated conversationalist. Soon her reputation preceded her. She had affairs with older married men, and one day received a call from Randolph Churchill, Winston Churchill's son, who was only calling because he had heard from a mutual friend she had loose morals when it came to romance. The first night they spent together he asked her to marry him, and she accepted. The Second World War had begun, and Randolph was convinced he was going to be called up any minute never to return, and he wanted a son and heir. Pamela didn't mind that their marriage was not founded on love, because she had just married into one of the most prominent families in England and was living with her in-laws, Winston and Clementine Churchill, who liked her and treated her as one of the family. After the birth of a son in late 1940, Pamela lost the baby weight and her former chubbiness along with it. She had gone from an ugly duckling to a swan and planned to divorce her husband. She didn't inform her in-laws of this and kept on staying with them on the weekends. She most likely met the man who would eventually be her third husband, W. Averill Harriman, through the Churchills. Harriman was in charge of coordinating the Lend-Lease program in the United Kingdom. America supplied the Allied forces with food, oil and weapons free of charge, and it was Harriman's job to make sure everything proceeded smoothly. Pamela began an affair with him, and if it had spread to the newspapers, it would have been disastrously scandalous and extremely embarrassing for the Churchills. Harriman didn't care, and neither did Pamela, who provided her new lover with crucial information about important figures in London. And, thanks to Harriman's connections, Pamela became a popular hostess through her numerous dinner parties where she served food few others could get their hands on, and certainly not in such quantities during a time of rations. She also became best friends with Harriman's daughter Kathleen. Like many of Pamela's lovers, Harriman also gave her a sizable amount of money, which she readily accepted. When Randolph Churchill got wind of the affair, he was furious, and society was already gossiping about Pamela's loose reputation. Truman Capote put some of the vulgar things that were said about her into answered prayers. Pamela's promiscuity was not random or even the result of passion. It was calculated to raise her own position. All her lovers had something to offer her, usually money. She lived off various men in the years between her divorce in 1946 and her second marriage in 1960. She once said, In my life I have always lived with men, for men, through men. She was defined by her relationships and had fallen in love with Ed Murrow, a prominent journalist who'd been important in the war. 
Their affair ended when he dumped her to return to his wife. Pamela followed him to New York, but to no avail, and for a time took up with Babe Paley's first husband, Stanley Mortimer, before moving to Paris. She, like many of her class, were no longer popular in London, under the new Labour government. In Paris, she continued to live a life of luxury, as Avril Harriman paid her the equivalent of $100,000 today as a yearly allowance, even though their affair had ended. She lived with diplomat and playboy Ali Khan at his French Riviera home for a time, before he left her to marry Rita Hayworth. She was still staying at Ali Khan's house when she met the 27-year-old heir to the Fiat fortune, Gianni Agnelli, who had become Morella Agnelli's husband. Gianni was extremely adventurous and usually got what he wanted, and Pamela was useful to him as a source of information and for her connections. In turn, he rented her a chateau and introduced her to European style. Pamela was so serious about marrying Gianni that she converted to Catholicism and was willing to make her son with Randolph Churchill illegitimate by seeking an annulment. But Gianni's disapproving family, especially his fiercely protective sisters, were against it. His brother Giorgio even shot bullets through Pamela's bedroom door while she was sleeping. Pamela terminated a pregnancy in 1948 after pressure from Gianni, thinking that it would prove her loyalty to him, but he continued to be unfaithful to her right under her nose. And one day she snapped when she found him in bed with the beautiful Anne-Marie de Stanville. She screamed and hit both of them until she exhausted herself. Gianni drove Anne-Marie home and on the way got into a serious car accident that left him with a leg broken in nine places and a cracked jaw. As he spent nine months recuperating in hospital, Pamela stayed by his side, still hoping he would marry her, although she was also conducting an affair of her own at this point. Gianni's sisters invited Morella to stay with them, and before long she had become pregnant, and Gianni knew he would have to marry her. She was a good choice of bride, and she would never end her pregnancy as Pamela had done. Gianni gave Pamela a huge settlement, a lavish apartment in Paris, and a Bentley, and she soon moved on to her next lover, the extremely wealthy banker Baron Ely de Rothschild. She continued to throw impressive dinner parties and travelled frequently, always perfectly made up wherever she went. Despite being well taken care of by various men, Pamela, now in her mid-thirties, was still on the hunt for a husband. While on a visit to New York, she met the successful Broadway producer Leland Haywood, who was then having marriage troubles with Slim Keith. Leland fell deeply in love with Pamela, and their affair proved to be the nail in the coffin of his marriage with Slim. However, Pamela was still holding out on Ely de Rothschild marrying her. She couldn't understand why he didn't leave his wife Lillian for her. In Pamela's eyes, Lillian was crazy. She'd once stalked Pamela around Paris and had driven her car into Pamela's Bentley on purpose. But Ely made it clear he had no intention of marrying Pamela and she was left with Leland as her only option. At last, she'd found a second husband and while he didn't have a title, their combined wealth allowed them to live very well indeed. Pamela sold her apartment in Paris for the equivalent of well over $4 million today and bought a 15-room apartment on Fifth Avenue, Manhattan, across the street from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which she spared no expense in decorating. Her first party was given in the honour of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, the former Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson, but in order to create buzz in society, she invited only leading people of the theatre. For her next party, now New York's high society were desperate to get acquainted with the new Mrs. Haywood, whatever her reputation, she invited Gloria Guinness and her husband Lowell, as well as Laurence Olivier and Henry Fonda, along with his daughter Jane. Many of Leland's Broadway connections came too, and the night was a success. Truman tried his best to remain loyal to his longtime friend Slim Keith. High society had all taken sides when Leland left her, and most were against Pamela, but eventually she wore down their malice and managed to intrigue even her staunchest enemies like Babe Paley. Truman made Pamela a swan and no doubt found her to be a fountain of inspiration for answered prayers. Pamela divided her time between her Manhattan apartment and the house in the country she had named Haywire. But by the mid-1960s, Leland's productions often failed to be a success and the Haywoods were spending more money than they earned. Leland gradually slipped into alcoholism, and by the time he died in 1971, Pamela was left with almost no money. She was now in her 50s, but knew her only way out of her money troubles was another advantageous marriage. 
She stayed with her son in London when she wasn't able to afford a good hotel, and then went on a cruise with Gloria Guinness before returning dejected to America. Then, at a dinner party, she was reacquainted with Avril Harriman, whose wife had died the year prior. Pamela wasted no time, and in September of 1971, only six and a half months after Leland's death, she became Mrs. Pamela Harriman. Her third and final marriage lasted until Avril's death in 1986, at the age of 94. He had a successful political career, and Pamela embarked on one of her own. She was the American ambassador to France from 1993 until her death in 1997, at the age of 76. Gloria Vanderbilt was named as a swan in the book collaboration between famous fashion photographer Richard Avedon and Truman Capote called Observations, which had a whole section dedicated to the swans of society. She is a fascinating and glamorous person, and she was also mocked in answered prayers. In the story, Truman added each one of her four husbands' names onto hers, making her Gloria Vanderbilt Dichiko Stokowski Lamette Cooper. She was furious about this, and said if she ever saw Truman again, she would spit on him. Gloria was born into the wealthy Vanderbilt family on the 20th of February 1924. She was the great-great-granddaughter of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, who made the family's fortune in railroads and shipping in the 19th century. Just under a year before Gloria's birth, her 18-year-old mother, Gloria Morgan, had married her 42-year-old father, Reginald Vanderbilt, whose fast living had depleted his money as well as his health by the time he died in 1925, leaving his wife in charge of their one-year-old daughter's 2.5 million trust fund, the equivalent of roughly $43 million today. The interest payments from the trust were the only income mother and child had to live on, but this did not come as a surprise to Gloria Morgan, who had married Reginald for love, knowing he had hardly any money left. Gloria Morgan was connected to international high society through her twin sister Thelma, Lady Furness, who was the mistress of Edward, Prince of Wales, the future Edward VIII. Gloria Morgan frequently stayed in Paris and the Riviera. She mixed in both Hollywood and London society, and while little Gloria often accompanied her mother on her travels, it was her maternal grandmother Laura and her beloved nurse Dodo who actually looked after her, and she saw very little of her mother. In the early 1930s, mother and daughter returned to America when little Gloria needed to have her tonsils removed. Her paternal aunt, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, offered to let the child recuperate at her house in Long Island. Gloria Morgan happily accepted and went back to Europe, securing the knowledge that her favourite Vanderbilt relative was looking after her daughter. After months without seeing her child, Gloria Morgan only realised something serious was going on when her allowance stopped, as she was no longer taking care of little Gloria. Aunt Gertrude had enrolled Gloria in school, her health had recovered, and the consensus in the family was that it was far better for her to remain with her aunt than go back to an absent mother too young and immoral to take care of her. Gloria Morgan's own mother Laura resented her daughter deeply and wanted to prove her an unfit mother. That was the case brought against Gloria Morgan when she attempted to regain custody of her child in 1934. Over the course of the highly publicised trial, Gloria Morgan was accused of being neglectful and abusive, of exposing her daughter to illicit material, and of conducting lesbian affairs. After the last accusation, the press was not allowed in the courtroom. Gloria Morgan's own former servants testified against her, as did her mother. In Depression-era America, the story of poor little rich girl Gloria Vanderbilt had some themes that were familiar to even the working classes. Many poverty-stricken families had been forced to put their children into institutions when they couldn't afford to look after them, and regaining custody proved to be nearly impossible. As the whole nation watched, the newspapers took sides. Some pitied the young mother, not yet 30 and attacked by her own family, while others took Gertrude's side, and that was ultimately the court's decision as well. Little Gloria later revealed many of the things she'd said about her mother in court were lies created by Gertrude's lawyer. She would be allowed to see her mother on weekends and live with her aunt during the week. One of the reasons the trial began in the first place was that little Gloria had told her aunt she was afraid of her mother and never wanted to see her again, which concerned Gertrude. The reason for Gloria's fear was a conversation she'd overheard her mother having about firing little Gloria's nurse Dodo. 
Ironically, after the court ruling, Dodo was fired by Aunt Gertrude anyway, and Gloria said that at the time Dodo's dismissal was the most terrible thing that has ever happened to me. It tore my life apart. Gloria felt her childhood ended when Dodo left, but she refused to let her spirit be broken. Gloria attended various schools, including Miss Porter's in Farmington, Connecticut, the same school Jackie Kennedy graduated from. From a young age, Gloria loved anything that involved fantasy, colour and artistic expression. Gertrude allowed her niece to decorate a room in a building on her estate called The Cottage, however she wished, and Gloria executed a vibrant Egyptian theme perfectly, transforming the room into a world of her own. Gloria graduated from the Arts Students League of New York, and over the course of her life, held many exhibitions and became skilled in various mediums, such as watercolour, oil paintings, collage, and creating her own home decor. Her beautiful homes with their vibrant, eclectic interiors could be a video on their own. She is, however, best known to the general public for her jeans. Her sons used to play a game of seeing how many women they could spot who had Gloria's name on their jeans. Her entry into the world of fashion began when she was a teenager and posed for Harper's Bazaar. Over the course of her life, she posed for almost all of the best photographers of the 20th century. Gloria was a natural in front of the camera and was already carving out a unique image for herself. As a young teenager, she wanted to look like Catherine Hepburn, and when she was 17 and travelled to Hollywood to visit her mother, Gloria endeavoured to look as grown up as possible, even experimenting with dyeing grey streaks in her hair. She soon caught the attention of famous actors like Van Heflin and Errol Flynn, who asked her out, and she was courted by producer Howard Hughes, but he ended their relationship when he received a phone call from Aunt Gertrude. Gertrude was desperate for Gloria to return to New York when she overstayed her planned vacation and sent her governess back, but Gloria couldn't bear the thought of returning to the comparatively boring and stilted world her aunt inhabited. Gloria and Gertrude fell out over the phone, and she couldn't turn to her mother for sound advice as Gloria Morgan was too preoccupied with her own affairs. So 17-year-old Gloria, desperate for love, understanding and freedom, decided to accept the marriage proposal of Pat Dicico, a rumoured mobster who was 15 years her senior, had a jealous and easily ignited temper, and whose first wife had been murdered in a case that was never solved. While other men were openly enchanted by Gloria's beauty and charm, Pat was changeable and didn't give her the same validation. She was wary of him. He had already insulted and threatened her when he found out she was dating Howard Hughes. But her mother approved of the marriage, as Gloria Morgan felt she had finally won the war against Gertrude, and besides, as she told her daughter, I got married at the same age. On her wedding day, all Gloria Vanderbilt could think of was literally running away, but she realised she had no one better to run to. The couple moved to Kansas, and one positive of her marriage was that Gloria was reunited with Dodo, who had attended the wedding and often visited her. Her first marriage lasted from 1941 to 1945, during which time Pat was extremely physically abusive towards her. She left him after meeting orchestra conductor Leopold Stokowski, who was in his early 60s, and they got married after only three weeks of knowing each other. Leopold loved Gloria and supported her artistic ambitions, but his work meant constant travelling and he was opinionated on how Gloria should live her life. On her 21st birthday, she came into her inheritance, and Leopold insisted she cut her mother off financially. Leopold wanted Gloria all to himself, and disliked mixing in society, while she found social events to be exciting. Leopold was usually away working, and Gloria couldn't go with him now that they had two young sons. Her friend Truman Capote's advice to fix her marital problems was to have an affair with William Paley, the head of CBS who was married to Babe Paley, who both Truman and Gloria knew well. She didn't follow Capote's advice, but she did divorce Leopold in 1955. Gloria had been taking acting classes for some time, and in 1954 she stood in for Audrey Hepburn at a charity ball performance, and afterwards was offered a role in a play called The Swan. Other theatre roles soon followed, as well as parts on TV, and Frank Sinatra, whom she was dating at the time, even wanted to put her in Ocean's Eleven. Her performances were praised by critics, and she had fallen in love once again with actor, producer, screenwriter and director Sidney Lumet, whom she'd met through her photographer friend Richard Avedon. 
Gloria married Sidney in 1956, and their marriage lasted until 1963. Her acting career spanned seven years, but she always felt the need to branch off into other areas of artistic exploration. She painted and held one-woman exhibitions and wrote many books. In 1959, Gloria was sued by Leopold for custody of their two sons. He didn't think she'd fight it, but she did and won, which must have been empowering considering her childhood. Gloria's fourth and final husband was actor, author and screenwriter Wyatt Cooper, with whom she had two sons, one of whom is journalist Anderson Cooper. They married on Christmas Eve 1963. While on holiday with Truman during her courtship with Wyatt, Gloria instructed him to be careful with what he wrote to her in letters, because she said Truman would probably get to them before she opened them, and he used everything for gossip. While Truman flattered Gloria to her face, behind her back she was a subject of gossip, as all his friends were. He mocked her quick succession of marriages, and thought she was vain and self-involved. He called her a nasty little girl, and blamed her for lying about her mother in the custody trial, when she was only ten and faced pressure from adults all around her. Truman also said she was horrible to her mother until only shortly before Gloria Morgan's death. In fact, for almost 20 years, mother and daughter didn't see or speak to each other. Gloria cut her mother off when she was 21, on the advice and pressure of her second husband. And after her horrific first marriage, which her mother had encouraged, it is understandable that Gloria's feelings towards her mother were complicated. The two were reconciled just before Gloria Morgan died. Truman claimed that Wyatt Cooper told him he wanted to leave Gloria, but was worried she would take away their two sons, and Truman also claimed Wyatt was always calling him asking for marital advice, and had divulged intimate details of his relationship with Gloria. Truman also said he believed the anxiety over whether or not to leave Gloria hastened along Wyatt's death in 1978 during heart surgery, after he had suffered a series of heart attacks. Truman went on to say that he had lunch with Wyatt only shortly before his death, where he had expressed his concern over whether Gloria would be a fit mother when he was gone. Truman said all of this only after Gloria ended their friendship, because of Lakota Basque 1965. In the story, Gloria's first husband walks into the restaurant, and she doesn't recognise him, and her friend comforts her by saying it's been 20 years since she last saw him. During Gloria and Truman's friendship, he happily attended events alongside her and went on holiday with her. He called her his darling friend and was happy to lounge around at her house. Personally, I believe Truman's claims are mostly lies. By many accounts, including her own, Gloria and Wyatt's marriage was a happy one. She called him the love of her life, and in an interview shortly before her death, she said if he had not died, she would still be married to him today. Privately, she liked to be referred to as Mrs. Cooper, and she never married again. Truman and Wyatt were close, and even worked on TV projects together, but it seems unlikely that Wyatt would go to a gay man for marital advice, while his wife had no idea there was even a problem in their marriage, especially as Gloria had already warned Wyatt that Truman adored gossip. As for the other claims, the characters in Lakota Basque are all vain and self-involved, and after reading many of Gloria's books where she explores her own life, I don't see self-involvement, but a talent for introspection. When the world's eyes are trained on you from such an early age, why wouldn't you spend a lot of time thinking about yourself? Her sons loved her deeply. Anderson Cooper has praised his mother many times, and it wasn't as if Gloria would be a struggling single mum after her husband's passing. There would always have been people around to help her, so Truman's claim that Wyatt thought Gloria would be an irresponsible mother seems far-fetched too. I believe Gloria did her best, but tragically in 1988, she witnessed her son Carter jump from the terrace of the family's 14th floor apartment, a moment she would relive for the rest of her life, wondering what she might have done differently. But once again, she faced tragedy with courage. She later wrote, don't give up, don't ever give up, because without pain there cannot be joy, and both are what make us know we are alive. Gloria died in 2019, and I think Anderson Cooper sums up her remarkable life best. My mum is a survivor, but she has none of the toughness that term often implies. She has strength, great stores of it, but she has refused to develop a layer of thick skin to protect herself. She remains vulnerable. It is a difficult and sometimes painful choice. She wants to remain open, open eyes, open mind, open heart. It has cost her, but she has succeeded. 
There is no one I know who is so open to the new. New experiences, new opportunities, new love, even if it means new loss. She truly believes the best is yet to come. That great adventures are out there, just around the corner. She may have been born into a world that no longer exists, but she lives in a place about to happen. Our last swan is not as well known as the others, but she should be. Known as the last Queen of Paris, Jacqueline de Ribe is still alive today at the age of 94, and over the course of her life, she has been a designer, businesswoman, philanthropist, and fashion icon. She was born in Paris on Bastille Day, the 14th of July, 1929, into a French aristocratic family. Her father, Count Jean de Beaumont, took part in the 1924 Olympics and was a successful banker, doubling his wife Paola's family fortune through various business ventures. Paola translated the works of Tennessee Williams and Ernest Hemingway into French, but she was not close with Jacqueline. She made fun of her daughter's features and dreams of being a ballerina, and in early childhood, Jacqueline spent most of her time with her maternal grandfather, who was always interesting to be around. He owned chateaus, cars and yachts, and his all-terrain Citroen car was complete with track rollers to tackle the snowy slopes he went down on a bobsled during winter. Jacqueline felt he was the only person who loved her, and when he died, she was so devastated, she said she was happy when World War II began, because then everyone would be as sad as she was. Ten-year-old Jacqueline and her siblings were sent to live at Andai, a town near the Spanish border, which their parents hoped would save them from the worst horrors of the war. In fact, as soon as they got there, the children's Scottish nanny was arrested by the enemy and locked up in a labour camp. The nanny's replacement was a mean-spirited French governess who the children loathed, and the house they were living in was requisitioned by the enemy who turned one of the bedrooms into an interrogation chamber. Jacqueline was kept up at night by the horrifying cries of pain that came from the room. The children were only moved inland when their parents feared an American invasion by sea, and at 13 Jacqueline went to live in the house of a count that was also filled with Germans. Jacqueline remembered that ladies of the night arrived by the truckload to entertain the Germans. Her childhood during the war was a harrowing experience, but it did not break Jacqueline's spirit. From a young age, she had been imaginative and interested in fashion. She loved dressing up and creating new clothes from whatever she could find, and when her grandfather was dying, she had organised a play with his whole household to cheer him up. She was put in charge of the school plays at the convent where she completed her education after the war. Her uncle saw a lot of promise in her and introduced her to his friend Christian Dior, just before Dior changed the world of fashion in 1947. The following year, Jacqueline married Edouard de Ribe, who came from an old aristocratic family who were not as wealthy as Jacqueline's, but far more conservative. The newlyweds dressed in formal attire just to eat dinner with each other, and Jacqueline found it difficult to adjust to the pressures of her new family. When she tried to hold her husband's hand in public, he said, don't be so common. Up until her marriage, she had very few clothes, had never worn heels or been to a hairdresser, and never worn makeup. But now she felt the need to express herself as a form of escape. She said she felt loved in her marriage, but not understood. However, being married allowed her to attend parties, and she was a guest at the so-called Party of the Century, the Base de Gay Ball, held at the Palazzo La Bia in Venice in 1951. Jacqueline and two Italian noblewomen imitated the painting style of Pietro Longhi for the costume ball, turning up in matching white dresses and black masks. Jacqueline became famous for her unique styles at parties. She often made her clothes herself, creating something new from older pieces that guaranteed her to stand out. Over the course of her life, she was a source of inspiration to many designers, and the first was Oleg Cassini, who was of aristocratic Russian and Italian descent. He sensed her artistic talent, and she cut out dress patterns in muslin to be sent to New York for him to make. To draw the sketches to illustrate what the finished product should look like, she hired a young Valentino. Many admired her talent for being stylish, and at a costume party where the theme was Come As Your Suppressed Desire, Morella Agnelli dressed up as Jacqueline de Reeb. Jacqueline was first put on the best dress list in 1956, a couple of years after she truly found her style, and she ascended to the Hall of Fame in 1962. 
In the early 1950s, Jacqueline began her ascent to fashion icon status when she went to New York and was spotted in a restaurant by Diana Vreeland, the fashion editor for Harper's Bazaar, who wanted Richard Avedon to take a photo of her. Jacqueline put on false eyelashes and had her hair done for the photo shoot, but Diana wanted her to look as she had in the restaurant, and fashioned the now iconic braid and simple makeup look that would be seen around the world. Jacqueline was likened to Nefertiti as well as the Sphinx, which she posed as in another photo. The iconic Richard Avedon portrait of her was included in his collaboration work with Truman Capote, Observations, where Jacqueline was officially named a swan. In 1983, Jacqueline created her first ready-to-wear collection, and her first fashion show was held at Yves Saint Laurent's home. She got a contract with Saks Fifth Avenue, and by the mid-1980s, her clothing was making $3 million a year, and had acquired many celebrity clients, such as Cher, Joan Collins, and Barbara Walters. She closed the company in 1995 due to health problems, but remained active in her philanthropic work. As well as fashion, Jacqueline and her husband took a great deal of interest in collecting art and antique decor pieces. And in 1961, Jacqueline took over as the manager of the International Ballet of the Marquis de Cuevas. She produced a three-part series based on the book The Italians by Luigi Barzini for French TV, which was a success, and she was offered a role by director Lucchini Visconti in his planned adaptation of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, but Visconti fell ill and never completed the project. Jacqueline produced Eurovision TV shows to benefit UNICEF in the early 1970s, and has championed the preservation of the natural world for many decades. I find her to be a very inspiring figure. She overcame a difficult childhood and broke the rules of the aristocratic world she moved in by being herself and doing what she loved with passion. Her style is elegant and timeless, just like her beauty. In researching this video, I've come across numerous subjects I'd enjoy diving deeper on. The amazing homes of the wealthy that have undergone so many transformations over the years, such as the many Agnelli residences, Gloria Vanderbilt's meticulously designed homes, and the houses of the swans featured in my last video. Another much underrated part of mid-20th century pop culture was the prevalence of models, artists, and celebrities in general who came from aristocratic backgrounds. Gloria Guinness's daughter, as well as two of Morella Agnelli's cousins, come to mind as models in the 1960s, and there are many more besides. I wonder if these subjects would interest anyone, and if so, please leave a comment below and feel free to suggest anything else you want me to do in the future. Thank you so much for watching and for all the support shown on my last Swans video. I bid you adieu until next time.